In this lecture, you'll learn about how client reads and writes work on your ONTAP system. And you'll also learn about the waffle file system. That's the write anywhere file layout. I'll explain how reads and writes work first. And the best way to explain this is by working through an example. So that's what I've got the diagram for here. And you can see in the example that we have got two controllers, controller one and controller two. And our clients are going to be sending reads and writes to aggregate one, which is owned by controller one. Controller 2 is the high availability peer for controller 1 and that aggregate. So starting off with a client over here on the left sends in a write request to write some data to aggregate 1. And we'll see that this is green data. So what happens with that data is it gets written to system memory on controller 1. And it also gets written to NVRAM on controller one and controller two. So system memory just on controller one, NVRAM on both controllers. So in the example, the write request has hit a network card, which is on controller one. And it has written that to its system memory and NVRAM. It then mirrors that NVRAM information over to controller two, and that information is sent over the high availability connection. Once that has been written into NVRAM on controller two, controller two will send an acknowledgement back to controller one, and then controller one will send the acknowledgement back to the client. And at this point, as far as the client is aware, the data has been written to permanent storage. But notice that the data has not been written to disk yet. It's been written to system memory and NVRAM. Memory is super fast, much faster than writing to disk. So it's done like this for performance. We send, we get the acknowledgement sent back to the client when it's been written to memory before it's been written to disk. We get much better performance that way. Then we have another write request come in. This is from another client in the example. Let's say that it is yellow data this time. That hits controller one and it gets written into system memory and NVRAM on controller one again and into NVRAM on controller two. Notice that when it comes into controller one, it goes into the top slot in system memory and all the existing data that was in system memory gets bumped down a slot. So it hits controller one, written to system memory and NVRAM. Controller one mirrors that over to controller two over the HA connection. Once it's written into NVRAM on controller two, controller two sends the acknowledgement back to controller one. Then controller one sends the acknowledgement back to the client. Then we have another write request come in. This is for the purple data this time. Same thing's going to happen where it gets written to system memory and NVRAM on controller one. It goes into the top slot in system memory and all the existing data that was there gets bumped down a slot and also gets written to NVRAM on controller one. It gets mirrored over the HA connection to controller two. Once it's in NVRAM on controller two, Controller two will send an acknowledgement back to controller one, and it will then send an acknowledgement to the client. Now, at this point, notice that NVRAM is half full. When NVRAM is half full, it's now time to write that data to disk. And we do that with a CP, which is a consistency point. So at the time of the CP, the data is going to be written down to the disk. And notice from the arrow here that it was written from system memory on controller one. Once the data has been written down to our disks, we then flush NVRAM and empty it so it's ready to accept new data. We'll come back to this point later, but first let's talk about CPs NVRAM and what happens when there's an HA takeover. 
So when consistency points occur, when do we write the data to disk? First up, when NVRAM is half full. Writing data to the disk takes some time. And while the system is writing the data to the disk, we're still going to be getting other writes coming in. So we can't do this when NVRAM is completely full or else there wouldn't be any space for those new writes coming in. So when NVRAM is half full, that's when the data gets written to disk, leaving some spare NVRAM for the new writes that are coming in while this is happening. Other times that consistency points occur. If 10 seconds have passed since the last CP, we don't want to leave too long a gap. So after every 10 seconds, if a CP hasn't occurred sooner than that, we'll write a CP then. Also, when a snapshot is taken. A snapshot is a consistent point in time image of the file system. We're going to be covering that in a later section, but that's also another time when we do a CP. And finally, when you, the administrator, shut down the system. When you do shut down the system, obviously you want it to be in a consistent state. You want everything to be written to disk. So a CP will also be taken at that point. Acknowledgements are sent to clients as soon as the data is written to memory. This occurs before the data is written to disk with a CP and that optimizes performance because it's much quicker to write to memory than to disk. As far as the client is concerned, the data is now written to permanent storage and it is permanently stored at that point. If there is a power outage, the contents of system memory, which is DRAM, are lost. And if the data was only written to system memory, this would cause an inconsistent state. Let's say that a client has written data to the storage system. It's got it in system memory, but it hasn't written it to disk yet, and it sends an acknowledgement back to the client. And then we have a power outage before it's been written to disk. Well, the client thinks it's been written to permanent storage, but the data has actually been lost. So we need to make sure that that doesn't happen. And the way that that's done is with NVRAM. NVRAM, unlike DRAM, the dynamic RAM, which is volatile, and is lost when there is a power outage, NVRAM is non-volatile. That's what the NV stands for, meaning it's still there. It survives a power outage. So if there is a power outage before the data is written to disk, we've still got it in NVRAM. We can recover it from there. NVRAM will write the data back into system memory, and it will be written to disk from there in a consistency point. So we do not write to disk from NVRAM. If we do have a power outage, it's written from NVRAM back into system memory, and then it goes from system memory down to the disks, just with a usual CP consistency point. The data is written to both controllers, NVRAM and an HA pair, so that if there's a takeover, the HA pair can write the data to disk. Say we've got controller one and controller two. Controller one fails, controller two takes over for it, well, controller two needs to have all the data there. So that's why we write NVRAM to both locations. Let's have a look at that happening now. So here we do have a failure of controller one. You can see that it, it's lost power. So everything that was in system memory is lost, but we've still got the data in NVRAM that is not being written to disk yet. That's in controller one and on controller two. We don't want to wait for controller one to come back up though. We want the system to be operational immediately with controller two taking ownership of the disks. So controller two does do that. It takes ownership of aggregate one. The data that's in NVRAM needs to get sent down to the disks. So for the next consistency point, the data is going to be written from NVRAM to system memory on controller two and then sent down to disk in the next CP. Okay, the next thing to talk about is Waffle, the Write Anywhere file layout. Waffle is optimized for write performance. That's why it's called the Write Anywhere file layout. It writes many operations to disk at once in a single sequential CP. As you saw in the example, we had many writes had come in from clients. We were sending acknowledgements back to them from memory, and it was only when NVRAM was half full that we sent those writes down to disk all in one go. So it doesn't do separate writes to disk for each individual client request. That would obviously give us much worse performance. 
It's called the Write Anywhere File Layout because data can be written anywhere on disk. It does not have to write metadata to fixed locations like some other file systems do. Metadata is data about other data. For example, when the file was written, who owns it, etc. This reduces the number of disk seek operations and improves performance. So let's see how that works. So let's look at other file systems that do have fixed locations on disk for the metadata. And here on the disk, we've already got some existing data on there. So you can see that the metadata is in the metadata section and the normal data is in the normal section. And we've got a gap here. Then we go to write some new data onto that disk and the metadata gets written to the metadata section. The normal data gets written to the normal data section and you can see that it's not sequential. So we have to do disk seeks there and that takes time, which affects performance. Waffle works differently. Waffle does not have any fixed locations on disk for any particular type of data. So here where we've got existing data on the disk, it's all written sequentially. And then when we go to write new data, that can be written sequentially as well, which gives us better performance. Okay, let's go back to our example with how the reads and writes were working again. So when we last left off, we just completed a consistency point on controller one, written the data to disk and flushed the contents of NVRAM. Now, when that happens, notice that it's NVRAM that gets flushed, that gets emptied. We have still got the contents of system memory. That's a good thing because the system memory is going to be used as a cache, which is going to improve our read performance. You'll see how that works coming up. So from where we left off, there is another write request. Let's say it's for blue data this time. What you would expect to happen is going to happen. So the data gets written into system memory on controller one. It goes into the top slot. Everything else gets bumped down a slot. And the data also gets written to NVRAM on controller one and controller two. Controller one sends over to controller two over the high availability connection. Once it's written to NVRAM on controller two, controller two sends the acknowledgement back again over the HA connection. Controller one can then send the acknowledgement to the client. Then another client sends in a read request for green data. This time, oh, actually, sorry, this is a read request now. So a read request comes in for the green data. What the system will do now is controller one will check to see if that is in the cache. And it is. The data is there. So controller one will immediately serve that data from the system memory cache and send it back to the client. That is much faster than having to fetch it by going to the disk. When that happens, the data moves back up to the top of the system memory cache. Whenever there's a read or a write, that gets cached at the top of the system memory cache. Everything else gets bumped down a slot. Then we have another read request. This time it is for red data. That was written quite a while ago and it's not currently in the cache. So when that happens, controller one again checks to see, is it in the cache first? It doesn't find it there, so it fetches it from disk. When it does that, it goes into system memory in the top slot, everything else gets bumped down a slot, and the data is sent out to the client. Okay, so those examples there, that was all direct data access, where the client was coming in and hitting a network port on controller one. Now let's look and see what happens with indirect data access, meaning that the client request hits a different controller, not the one that owns the aggregate, which is where the data is. So here we have a read request coming in from a client for that red data again. So here we've, we've gone back a step. It's exactly the same as the last step where a client has sent in a read request for red data, but this time, the client hits a different controller, not controller one, which owns the aggregate. So again, the red data is not currently in the memory cache on controller one. So that comes into controller two. Controller two does not own the aggregate, but it knows that controller one does. So that will be fetched over the cluster interconnect. 
So controller two, ask controller one over the cluster interconnect to get the data. Controller one looks in its memory cache and it sees that it is not there. It then fetches it from disk. The red data goes into the top slot in system memory on controller one. Everything else gets bumped down the slot. The data gets sent over the cluster interconnect over to controller two, and then it sends it to the client. So notice here that even though this was indirect data access and the client hit controller two, we don't use the cache on controller two. We're still using the cache in controller one, the controller which owns the aggregate. This is done deliberately because it means that the cache is always going to be on the controller which owns the aggregate. It's not spread around all the different nodes. Because let's think about what would happen if it was actually cached in controller two. Well, maybe this is an eight node cluster and the next time a request comes in for that red data, it hits node three. Well, it wouldn't be in node three's cache. It would have to fetch it. It's going to fetch it over the cluster interconnect anyway. And then node three would have to put it in its cache. And then maybe the next time the client hits node four, node four would have to put it in its cache. That would be really inefficient. So rather than having data spread across multiple caches on different nodes, and maybe you, you hit a node with a cache, maybe you don't, it's always cached on the controller, which owns the aggregate. So this means that the caches on each node are optimized to give you the best chance of the data actually being in the cache. Okay, well, last thing to talk about is performance optimizing algorithms. So as I was explaining the way that things work there, I said that every time there's a read or a write, then that data goes in the top slot in the system memory cache and everything else gets bumped down a slot. That's basically how it works, but it's actually a bit more advanced than that. Performance optimizing algorithms distinguish high value randomly read data from sequential and or low value data and maintain that data in cache to avoid time consuming disk reads. So it's going to be random data rather than sequential data, which is going to be in the cache. And when I say sequential data, I mean that's written sequentially across the disk. And the reason for this is that spinning hard drives actually give pretty good performance for sequential data because they're not having to do disk seeks. And another thing is that the this sequential data, it tends to be larger as well. We've only got so much system memory cache in the system, so we want to make the best use of it. So because of that, it's going to be the random, which tends to be smaller reads, and which are going to get the biggest boost in performance from being in the system memory cache that we're actually going to put in the memory cache. Those larger sequential reads, they can be fetched from disk because we're not going to get such a big boost from that if we did have it in the cache anyway. Another thing is that we have read ahead. Read ahead is a proactive mechanism that enables the system to detect and improve performance for read patterns. So the system is going to be monitoring what data is being read, and it's going to be looking out for patterns where if this data was read, then typically this next data is after that, and then this next data is after that as well. When a pattern is detected, the whole pattern is going to be cached into memory. So that way, again, it's designed to give you the best chance of data being served from the memory cache rather than having to be served from disk. Okay, so that was how our reads and writes work and also Waffle. See you in the next lecture.